Please, questions, please. Any questions for Jack? The question that I've got is, uh, sorry, I, I totally agree we've got to protect jobs and so on, but it's getting the idea if there's going to be any discussion anywhere, uh, I don't see how we're going to, we could discuss with the kind of nature that the EU is. It, I mean, somebody said that they've got policy, uh, they've got austerity, it's not a policy, it's... Um, it's built into the structure and uh, you know anything to do with the unions and so on um, that's seen as being anti-competitive so you know what is there to discuss actually in this this is one of the reasons I think that people are saying you we need to come out without a deal because what deal can you actually discuss with this group it's okay. beyond any sort of discussion because they're set up for a particular purpose and they're not there for they're not there for changing things fundamentally, or you know, around us. They've got their principles. I wish we stuck to our principles, for socialists. Okay. Right, yeah. Any more questions for Jack? Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a different view. I think that actually the whole issue of the Brexit is a state-minded situation that we are going to go through it. Uh, I, I think that's a uh, it's a balloon full of air that actually distracting people from what is coming, Brexit, and all the consequences of Brexit. And I think that we should be actually addressing that problem either than uh, choosing in between two legs in, in the European Union, which is the people's vote, or oh, one leg and one, one leg in, one leg out, which is the same, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's and uh, probably May. Mm -hmm. And the, the one, the, the third one is actually two foot outside the labor, outside Europe. Mm -hmm. And I think that we lost the vote, and we have to respect the, the will of the people. However, the the the, the referendum was only thirty seven percent of the total election, of the electoral. We have to respect it, and we have to prepare for that issue. And that issue is the economy, and the economy is going to be hopefully affected by that. So that is my main concern, yeah. the, the, the economy of this country. Yeah. The rest, as I said, is a balloon affair. Brexit has been exaggerated by the press, all kind of press, BBC, and whatever you go to news in the, in the television, Brexit is there. And it's actually consuming. Brexit is chaotic and we have to face it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll be Stuart Richardson, um, Treasurer of the Birmingham PC. Um, I think that there can be no objection, and um, you know, and Labour MPs have been trying to uh, sort of manoeuvre to try and avoid some of these sort of catastrophic sort of effects of a no deal in the sense of, uh, for instance, in farming, you know, if there will be quite large tariffs imposed. Um, at, uh, which will be very, very dangerous for 60% on beef. British, British uh, farming. Yeah. And um, obviously that you need to have some sort of transitional deal to facilitate trade and, and communication. I think the, but the, it seems to me it, what's very important in this discussion is to, um, and as Jack referred to in his early uh, attitudes to these things, you've got to be clear about the sort of pro-austerity positions of the EU. I think, I don't know if people have seen it, but it's worth to watch. The BBC recently did a three-part program, and the second part was about the Greek crisis. And now there's a debate in Britain, should you increase health expenditure by 3% a year or mm -hmm. the Labour Party 5% a year? You know, um, That's not the situation the Greek people will face at the present time. Um, and the Greek people um, were presented with a deal, they voted on it, on it, rejected it, and then um, the EU imposed upon by refu refusing to uh, maintain loans, even worse deal. So, you, so in Greece today, you don't have a 3% or 5%, you have the closure of a third of the health uh, service, you know, the hospitals, you know. And then you can see the other pressure being exerted on, on uh, um, Italy. I'm no talk for the regime in power in Italy, but they are in trying to impose very limits on state expenditure. So um, I'm all in favour of, of organ organising for sort of transitional relations and avoiding 
creating some of the chaos um, and to have a smooth Brexit process. But I think the, one of the saddest things I think has been generated um, in this whole discussion is a lot of the young people have very illusory notions how wonderful the EU is, you know, and it's not. It's a pro. It's a long-term pro-austerity organisation devoted to the interests of capital. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's fine. That's fine. Um, all right. Uh, starting point is that, and I say this with some regret, uh, for the reasons I've indicated, is yes, we do have to respect the deci decision of the referendum. Um, I don't think you can turn around and give two fingers. Uh, all I would say, uh, anyone who doubts uh, where public opinion is should have been with me yesterday in King Stanley in my constituency on the doorstep. The message was absolutely unmistakable. They don't want us to roll over and die uh, and with any old deal or, <coughs> or no deal, uh, but I think we have to do everything we can to uh, secure the best possible deal to protect workers and the British national interest, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, on the point about the, nat the nature of the European Union, uh, as I said earlier on, um, is that if it uh, started as a capitalist club, uh, of course it remains, it remains uh, the very much uh, a, a, an, an enterprise economy uh, with its weaknesses as well as its strengths. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'm not one of those who uh, lionises the European Union. I think there is a legitimate argument in favour of significant changes in the European Union, and I think what happened to the people of Greece was absolutely scandalous, uh, and indeed we strongly oppose that. But having said that, uh, for anyone who then thinks, I'm not saying this was said, said in quite this way, well, because it's a, you know, a, it, it, it is, in inverted commas, a capitalist club, it doesn't matter if we leave. Well, come and say that to workers in the Jaguar, uh, or Land Rover, or GKN, uh, or, or right the way down to the small companies in the supply chain that are dotted all over Erdington. And incidentally, one other reason for me why I'm so passionate about their cause, is I always say about Erdington, it's rich in talent, but it's one of the poorest constituencies in the country. And there is a simple reality, if we do not get strong, robust, and continuing arrangements around for this issue of customs union, customs arrangements, also the relationship with the single market, uh, then the consequences for British workers will be very serious indeed. Already automotive industry is making plans to stop production for at least a week, could be up to a month uh, after the 29th of March. Um, if we do not have a continuation uh, of that smooth movement of parts and, and uh, across nation state boundaries, 1,100 lorries a day arriving uh, here in the West, uh, West Midlands. Uh, if we do not have that guaranteed on a continuing basis, the consequences will be very serious indeed for big, medium, and small companies uh, in automotive. Um, uh, it's not just, by the way, uh, what would happen if we crashed out without a deal and said, well, it doesn't matter, being in the European Union. Workers' <coughs> rights. Uh, I, I nearly said Mrs. Thatcher. Um, uh, uh, Theresa May uh, says, uh, th don't worry, uh, work, uh, if, if we crash out without a deal, uh, we'll guarantee workers' rights. Does anyone here believe that? Uh, uh, in the wor immortal words of Rab C. Nesbitt, you'd be after heat uh, uh, to uh, believe in that. Um, uh, I don't want that raft of law that we fought for over the years in the European Union on workers' rights, including the example I gave in relation to the Acquired Rights Directive which meant so much to workers. I don't, want, I, to, let me finish this point. I don't want to surrender that territory. And when it comes then to this notion of uh, the, uh, the, the fund that she's trying to establish, um, um, th th there's little point, to be perfectly frank, uh, going down the path of what's pork barrel politics uh, in terms of a bit of a bung for my constituency or for any other constituency if the consequences for workers in that constituency are very serious indeed. In terms of young people, I could give you numerous examples. Uh, they, can I just give you one from yesterday? Uh, I had Aston University approach me um, with, uh, oh, desperately concerned about what's going to happen to their students in terms of arrangements they currently have with the European Union, like the Erasmus program. And do you know what they did? They sent to me stories uh, of, of young people whose lives have been transformed because of the opportunities that have been opened up through European Union schemes, and in particular, 
uh, Erasmus. Uh, so uh, just, just to say this in conclusion, I'm obviously glad to take further questions, is no one's under any illusion. To, uh, the, uh, is, uh, are there legitimate criticisms of the European Union? Yes, there are. Uh, but if what we end up doing is having a debate about uh, why, well, it doesn't really matter coming out of the European Union, all I would say, forgive me if I say it in the bluntest possible terms, that would be to betray the interests of those we represent. Because it bloody well does matter. It does matter. Happy to take some more questions. Okay. Okay, three people have indicated. <coughs> yeah. Before we do, uh, yeah. could we just check if either of the two other speakers are here? Sorry. David Hearn. Oh, hi. Welcome. Um, and that's for Fred Grinrod. Fred Grinrod. Uh, apologies okay. for being late. I got, we were waiting for quite some time outside the other door. Oh, 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 oh. If it's any comfort, the first time I came here, I did exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Quite symbolic, really. Isn't it? <coughs> 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 Okay, we just need to adjust our timings accordingly. Yeah, okay. but, uh, it's great you're here. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, question number one. Well, um, I mean, I think um, Jack's history lesson was uh, was very informative, but he's, in a sense, that's what it was. It's a history lesson that was in the past. And I think now we've got the situation where um, the EU could, could afford concessions when the world economy was going forward. We're not in that situation now. The world economy is going backwards, and as, as Pip has already pointed out, um, the EU is a capitalist club and ultimately looks after the interests of businesses, not the interests of workers. And that's, re that's really what's going to be uppermost in their thinking, whether it's, whether it's on Brexit or any other, or, or, or anything else come to that. And of course there's a lot of project fear uh, going on. It started, with the, it started with the Scottish independence referendum, continued to the EU referendum, and of course we sit in the Labour Party as well conflating, uh, making an enormous issue of anti-Semitism, which, which isn't really a massive issue in the Labour Party as far as, as far as I'm aware, but it's also a stalking horse to try and undermine the prospects of a Labour government. So I think we should take, take what, some of these things with a, very large, with a very large pinch of salt, because the, uh, the EU ultimately was in the interest of most of the major companies, and that's why they supported Remain. And of course, they're not going to be honest with us about why they want us to remain if it's not... If it's not if it's not in our interests, and the best, the best way to 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 to, to, um, to uh, protect workers' good uh, interests is by trade is by trade union power, and I don't believe that the EU is ultimately going to uh, safeguard that because how many pieces of active trade union legislation have been passed since, since the days of Margaret Thatcher? The EU has done absolutely nothing to stop those to stop those being passed. The EU does not guarantee workers' rights at. Uh, it does not guarantee workers' rights at all. And I think that the mistake we're making is looking at everything in a capitalist context um, in, in, uh, and not, uh, not having anything beyond the private ownership of uh, the motor industry or anything else, and that's the real problem. When you talk about the British national interest, I'd be interested in Jack's views on this, um, what they're talking about is the interests of wealthy shareholders, not the interests of people who work in the JAG or, or anywhere else come to that. It's the interests of capitalism that, uh, that they regard as the national interest. And how do you stop things like, how do you stop things like the posted workers directive, which led to the big dispute at the Lindsay Oil Refinery 10 years ago? We've had strikes of Estonian ferry workers and Condor ferries in Portsmouth over that, and so on. None of those things are going to be changed with, uh, with or without a deal. And I think, how do you protect workers' interests okay. with, with those things on, on the, in, the EU, okay. in the EU armour room? Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, more in more in reference to, for example, what's happened to the Honda factory. Yeah. That's one of the most sophisticated car companies yeah. in the world, and they're, they're leaving. Now, they may have left over time. Um, you know, to, excuse me, I'm, I'm new to doing this. Mm. This sure, sure. So, so it's, I mean, if a, if a company like that can leave, yeah. Pub Sticks and leave, I mean, any international firm that has got an office in the city, in London or in Birmingham, Manchester, yeah. they can leave so easily with the internet these days, you know, everything's yeah. online, they can just move an office. They yeah. can rent another office like this in Frankfurt, wherever, and they can go. So what do you replace it with? You know, how are you going to replace that job, those jobs? Yeah. I mean, if it's not Honda, who is it going to be? And so, more example for yourself, Mr. Johnny, you know, someone like Jaguar. Yeah. Landover, um, um, I, mean, I mean, they've already, what, 5,000 jobs they've already, yeah. and at least 1,500 of those, to my understanding, of. Brexit <coughs> the other three thousand debatable. That's correct. But I mean one of the things I was thinking briefly before is 
Well, here in Birmingham, for example, we should have maybe have someone like Elon Musk here, you know, trying to encourage someone like Tesla to come and build a big, or we yeah. have a new version, a brand new yeah. British company. How on yeah. earth do you replace that? That's our job. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And the third and final question. Cathy Gaffney, uh, you're the Union. Uh, I'll just say before my question that um, I go a long way back as well, and uh, I'm sure Jack Dorman didn't remember me for the, uh, the, the, the uh, what's it, cricket lane in North? Glenwick. The Glenwick cricket yeah. lane. I was a shop steward and a, a UW branch secretary and no. shop steward at Landis and Gear at the time. Oh, yeah. uh, and I remember handing out leaflets saying we shouldn't go to the common market and all this sort of stuff. But some of the, the things that, I, that I've been involved with since then ha, ha, has made me realise what is at stake now. And uh, for example, I've been very involved with the Hazard campaign and you can see the double-edged nature of the EU. Um, I mean, one thing that has, has come forward recently is that uh, there's an EU body that has given permission to all the employers who have applied, and there's a big consortium come forward to get permission to work with a thing called hexavalent chromium, which is extremely toxic, gives lots of different cancers. Uh, and every time that any employer has, has, uh, has applied, they've just given them the permission. It's only supposed to be in exceptional circumstances. Um, and it looks like this big consortium will go uh, and be allowed that, that thing. But on the other hand, what we can see is that the employers have been, um, uh, th sorry, that the government has, has, has been trying uh, everything that they can do to, to um, privatise and to weaken workers' rights. And, and if there was a left Labour government, it would have been a different situation in terms of wanting to come out of the EU. EU. They've been proven on workers' rights, but given the Tory government has been doing everything they can to, to destroy workers' rights, I can't see that it would be at all uh, of any help. So my question really is, um, what re in the event of all the different possible scenarios that's going to um, transpire over, over Brexit, how can we best protect workers' rights? Okay. All right. And most environmental as well. Uh, sure. Um, 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 and by the way, is that uh, we, uh, over the years we've had all sorts of commemorative events at the Grand Duke Festival. I think some of you may have seen the plane when it came here to uh, here to Birmingham. Uh, it was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. It looked a bit like you. Uh, they, well, I tell you, I tell you what. I'm deeply proud to this day because we fought hard and long. Jarvin Desai and myself. The biggest mobilisation in labour movement history. Twenty thousand workers. Twenty thousand workers there on July the 11th, 1977, uh, in support of remarkably, when you think about it, a workforce that was predominantly newly arrived Gujarati women from East Africa. Um, it was a landmark dispute, particularly against the background of that that terrible era, which some of you here will remember. Because the best, I'll tell you two stories. First of all, on July the 11th, 1977. Uh, we met with 150 workers from the, from Rover that had come down they, in three, three coach loads. Uh, secondly, uh, I must tell you this story, um, is that uh, there was a group of guys from the Royal Docks, uh, it wasn't just the Royals, but it was predominantly the Royals, um, who asked to meet with Jarvan and myself first thing that morning. Um, and uh, 10 years earlier, uh, the uh, Dockers and Meat Porters had marched for Enoch Powell. Mm -hmm. The Rivers of Blood speech and Mark Free not yeah, Enoch Powell. These guys came in. Jay Arvin, by the way, is four foot eleven foot high in her sari. Uh, this guy must have been about six foot four. And he said, We wanted to see a Jarvin and Jack. He said, uh, uh, I, he said, some of our number, he said, um, marched for Enoch Powell ten years ago. And he then said, We're ashamed and we're sorry. And I'll never forget the moment when Jarvin Desai, four foot eleven, walks up to this six foot three, six foot four guy puts her hands around him and says, never mind, you're here now. <laughs> um, now, um, the, uh, on the point about what the European Union would do if we made it, the, first of all, the, uh, the, all the indications are that if we made moves, in answer to your question, if we made moves in relation to, for example, what we call permanency on the customs union arrangements, um, that they would move. 
Secondly, if we look at the issue of trade union power, I mean, I fought for trade union power all my life. Um, if you look at the trade unions in Britain and the trade unions across continental Europe, they are all effectively unanimous in saying that we don't want to see the breakup of the European Union and a world dominated by Trump's America. Um, that, uh, and so if what we're doing is to talk about trade union power, we've got to listen to trade unions because that's exactly what trade unions say. Uh, what they argue, uh, different, different views, but what they argue is of course a reform agenda and to protect some of the progress made. But there's no, move, there's no movement on the part of trade unions across Europe uh, to break up or come out of the European Union. Um, the next thing is about not guaranteeing workers' rights. Um, well, we've got a straight choice at the next stages. On the one hand, uh, we can trust Theresa May to guarantee workers' rights. I don't. Um, on the other hand, uh, what we can do, and quite rightly, uh, is to protect the progress that we've made through, through the European Union. I can give you a, a, a seven different directives straight away where workers' rights, battles that we fought over the years, in my case, the Eastbourne Dustman test case, uh, where we made significant progress. Has it gone far enough? Absolutely it's not gone far enough. Absolutely. But should we throw away uh, though that progress made? No. Um, on the point then um, is in, when you make it about in whose interests, um, is, the, uh, is this, about, is it shareholders? Or, maybe there's been a, <coughs> a disturbing trend over the last 30 years of the decline of trade union power has seen more and more money go to boardroom pay and to shareholders, and that's fundamentally wrong. And, and actually, we won't bore you with the details, but there's, uh, we've got an event on Monday, the House of Commons, where one of the things we're launching is that you've got to put that balance right at the next stages. But having said that, in whose interest? I'll tell you ultimately in whose interest. It's that engineer who wept uh, in October 2010. It's Warren who moving into the house of his dreams with the woman of his dreams. These are the people we represent, for God's sake. You know, out there, their future hangs on us and what we do. Uh, and, and that's why I've been very clear about what I intend to do. On your very interesting point about Honda, uh, when Honda was quite on the day that they said it wasn't str uh, strictly in relation to uh, Brexit. Um, but what was interesting was the Japanese uh, ambassador then did this interview uh, on BBC, in which he said, uh, because if you look back at it, by the way, back to the 1980s, and I wasn't a fan of, of how it happened in the 1980s because they didn't recognise trade unions to begin with. But if you look back to the 1980s with the three big Japanese car companies uh, coming into our country, um, it, and, and then what happened subsequently, uh, key to the, the, the development of that market actually was the, as they regarded it to be, the stability of the European market. Uh, and if you move, that's why they, they yeah, exactly, the exactly. And if, if you move to a co complete chaos where no one quite knows what's going to happen next, of course that impacts. Uh, and then on your point, which again I thought was a very interesting point, is after the announcement of the four and a half thousand job losses in Jaguar Land Rover, we had this uh, summit the following Monday, uh, and Ralph Speth is the chief executive, uh, and the unions were all there. Uh, they, they, myself as the MP. Um, a very, very powerful presentation about the direction of travel of the car industry. Because again, your interesting point, uh, I'd prefer to see it done by JLR.Tesla, but I take the point you're making, is that uh, part of their problem, Brexit is a real problem, of that there's no doubt, uh, but also part of their problem is the transition from diesel. But the direction of travel is electrification. Yeah. You know? and, and incidentally, I think that the, the Unite, my, my union, I, I think they've done some excellent work on this, where if you've not seen it, they've got an outstanding publication about the transformation of the car industry at the next stages, mm. in which they're arguing, and they're dead right, that we shouldn't stand in the way uh, of that process of electrification, for example. Mm. Uh, on the contrary, but it should be managed in the best interests of workers, yeah, and going forward, no, I think that's absolutely right. Just one final point, is I have to say this, is that, um, in coming back to the point that you made, um, is, uh, uh, I don't think for one moment we should gloss over the fact that anti-Semitism is on the rise throughout Europe and America. Um, and uh, it grieves me to say this, but that has also infected, they may be a small minority, but it's infected people in the Labour Party. And I'm somebody, by the way, personally, who's been pro-Palestinian all my life, and fought for a two-state solution. But 
I've seen some of the stuff that was directed at Luciana. Uh, I've seen some of the death threats uh, at, that were directed. Um, and it's absolutely shameful. So can we be clear, uh, when we're, whenever we're talking about this, we should never, ever, ever, ever sound like we're in denial. Uh, of uh, Never, ever. Uh, I mean, I took uh, back five years ago to uh, Muslim sixth formers from the North Birmingham Academy, women, uh, to Auschwitz-Birkenau and saw the consequences of the greatest crime in human history. And when you get Jewish cemeteries, for example, being defaced in countries across Europe, we've got a bloody problem. And no one, no one, no one should ever be in denial about that. My, my apologies, just one final thing about that, why I feel very strongly. Um, uh, I was born, my dad came over as a, as a building worker, uh, and my mum came over to train as a nurse. I was born in Kilburn, you know, because they came, they came from Ireland. And I'll never forget when I was a kid, the footermans were next door and four doors up at the Coens. We used to play football down in Gladstone Park together. And I was nine years old when I discovered that they had both had <coughs> relatives who died in the Holocaust. And I couldn't remember it. So forgive me if, I'm, if I feel strongly about this. Never again. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. It is in our being that we stand against that and we never, ever equivocate. Hope the rest of your day goes well. <laughs> Thank you.